Prologue of Concerning Isabel Carnaby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marian Spiegel. Concerning Isabel Carnaby by Ellen Thornycroft Fowler. Prologue. A woman's tongue is ever slow to tell the thing she does not know. There was a large dinner party in Grosvenor Square at the house of Lord Kesterton, one of the new peers. Are you thoroughly enjoying your glories and honors? inquired Lady Eleanor Gregory of her host, who had taken her down to dinner. Well, I must confess that I feel rather like the man who lost his wife and said it was very dull but very peaceful, and I have come to the conclusion that peace is an acquired taste. Then do you hanker after the fighting in your dear old house of commons? Lord Kesterton smiled. I am afraid I still babble a green benches when I get the chance. The House of Commons is like certain women of one's acquaintance. You quarrel with them, and they expect too much from you, and you vow you will enjoy yourself and have nothing more to do with them. But all the same, they have spoilt your taste for anything else, and they make all other women seem insufferably dull. And now I have got to scold you for dismissing my poor dear Harry, said Lady Eleanor. "'Uncork the vials of your wrath,' replied her host, "'and I will endeavour to suffer and be strong. "'I shall appeal to Mr. Matterley to second my vote of censure,' continued the lady, turning to the royal academician who sat at her right hand. "'I suppose I ought to talk to you about art, but I am going to talk to you about politics.' "'Please do not talk to me about art, dear lady. I could not bear it from you,' replied the artist. "'Why not?' because I should thereby discover that you knew nothing at all about it, and the one rag of face still wrapped round my jaded spirit is my belief in your omniscience. If you take that away from me, I shall sink lower and lower, and shall probably end in doubting the wisdom of woman, or the supremacy of the British ratepayer. Lady Eleanor laughed. And don't you feel like this when I talk about politics? Far from it. I know absolutely nothing about them myself, and when I hear you speak familiarly— nay even flippantly of whips and under-secretaries and similar ruling powers i regard you with awe as a mighty sibyl juggling with the mysterious forces of the unknown i see it must sound rather impressive impressive is not the word it sounds simply tremendous calling under-secretaries by their christian names seems to me like patting a thunderstorm or playing with an earthquake yet I have often heard you do it without an apparent qualm. It is marvellous. Lady Eleanor was very proud of what she considered her wire-pulling powers, and therefore she enjoyed the academician's persiflage. It was in cases like this that Matterley showed himself such a clever man. He always said disagreeable things, but he generally took care that they were the sort of disagreeable things that people wanted him to say. Women liked Mr. Matterley, because they said he did not flatter them. They never found out that it was because he flattered them that they liked him so much. "'When I talk about art, however, you regard me as an unlessened girl, I suppose,' suggested her ladyship. "'That certainly is my idea. But, had you given me time, I would have decked its crudeness with some flowers of speech.' "'I'm so glad that I did not give you time, then.' It would be insufferable if you began to be pleasant. Your raison d'etre would be gone if you left off telling disagreeable truths, and we should all leave off liking you. The artist smiled. It is very kind of you to say that, Lady Eleanor, but don't you think that the men who tell palatable fibs are really the popular men? No, I don't, Lady Eleanor hastened to assure him. Now that you are immensely popular, you must know that you are and yet you always say straight out whatever you think, and never mind how disagreeable it is. It is this truthfulness that makes us all admire and trust you. The artist smiled again. Do you remember, continued Lady Eleanor, how you once told a whole group of us our faults at a party at the Farleys? You said that I was ambitious, and that Lady Farley was cruel, and that Isabel was shallow, and that Violet was cold. I have never forgotten it, I thought it was so nice and plucky of you to tell us the truth straight out like that. Mr. Matterley remembered that he had once said these things. He also remembered that he had never thought any of them, but this he did not consider it necessary to confess. But where are the politics you said you were going to talk to me about? 
oh of course i forgot i want to ask your opinion as to the way in which the government has treated me you know harry mortimer was lord kesterton's under-secretary no i mean under-secretary at the war office and it was a very comfortable arrangement for both of them well then lord kesterton took his own peerage without a single twinge of conscience but now that poor dear harry has succeeded to his uncle and become lord gravesend he has got to be sent away like an efficient footman because they say they cannot both of them be in the house of lords so please tell your host that you think he has behaved abominably i do indeed such conduct seems to me unjustifiable it is like drinking one's self and insisting on one's servants being teetotalers lord kesterton laughed Matterly always amused him and he loved to be amused but you are keeping back part of the truth lady eleanor he said we have endeavoured to break the blow to gravesend by giving him the governorship of new north wales lady eleanor sighed that is nothing i wanted harry to have a career you forget that he is going to marry you replied her host surely that is a career sufficient to satisfy even the most ambitious of men and to occupy the time of the most industrious of course it is what i ought to have said was that i wanted harry to have a recreation recreation means variety of occupation suggested lord kesterton and he would hardly find that after marriage at the war office do you think he will find it in new north wales most certainly because there in his official life his duty will be to rule you are very rude laughed lady eleanor i shall talk to mr matterly instead and ask him if he doesn't think that gravesend is a very depressing title for a young man to come into it suggests the quintessence of finality replied the artist there is no doubt of that lord gravesend fiance nodded i mean to alter it and to call him the lord harry instead and that would be prettier don't you think far prettier also more colloquial and i love colloquialisms they are the next best thing to stories in dialect a story in dialect invariably does me good because i do not understand it then do you think that it is the things we don't understand that do us good queried the lady of course that is why our prescriptions are always written in latin and our menus in french i see when i read in the vulgar tongue continued mr matterly that a man is brave and a woman is beautiful i am not impressed i have met brave men in the flesh and i have found that they generally talk about nothing but slain beasts and go to sleep after dinner i have also met beautiful women do you find them equally disappointing asked lady eleanor a woman always seems to think that if she has a face she need not possess a head as well personally i prefer both you are shockingly cynical here the power of dialect comes in continued the artist for when i read that a man is bra and a woman is bonny i know no wells of experience from which to draw cold water to throw on these illusions therefore my imagination runs riot and clothes the parties thus described in impossibly perfect attributes i never met a bra lad or a bonny lassie in my life that i know of so i still picture such beings as ideal and glorious creations after a little more conversation about airy nothings lady eleanor turned to her host and asked in a low voice who is going to take harry's place at the war office the secretary of state raised his eyebrows i really cannot tell you cabinet secrets my dear lady oh yes you can i want dreadfully to know and i will promise faithfully not to tell anybody if only you will take me into your confidence please do there's a dear man lord kesterton hesitated lady eleanor certainly was very attractive and it is always pleasant to please a pretty woman seeing him hesitate she increased her coaxing tenfold well suppose i tell you as great a secret he said at last will you give me your word not to repeat it to anybody of course i will i should never think of doing such a thing lord kesterton lowered his voice to a confidential pitch the new under-secretary for war is our honourable friend the member from chaford lady eleanor's eyes sparkled with delight it was her role to stand behind the scenes of government and to give little jerks to the ropes at least she thought it was and now both her curiosity and her love of power were gratified i am so glad she exclaimed he is such a pleasant man and very clever too don't you think 
like all women lady eleanor gregory considered the word clever was complimentary like all men lord kesterton considered it quite the reverse clever he replied my dear young lady what a word to apply to a brilliant politician why he is already one of the ablest men in the liberal party and he has only been in the house three years i am so glad you told me it will interest harry most tremendously lord kesterton started but you gave me your word that you would not tell anybody so i did i quite forgot but harry doesn't count you know i never keep anything from him except of course the number of dances that i give to other men but that is different i cannot see why gravesend doesn't count he always appears to me to be a man of considerable weight oh but you are not engaged to him if you were you would know that his considerable weight could be tampered with by the display of a little tact and persuasion but now tell me more about harry's successor of course i know all about who he is to-day but who was he yesterday i want to read up the back numbers of his story the host shook his head back numbers are always dull and generally fictitious i find i don't they amuse me immensely especially with portraits from early and hideous childhood up to present day lady eleanor said the secretary of war in a very low voice do you know why you have been successful in extracting this confidential information from me no guess lady eleanor thought for a moment because you knew you could trust me not to repeat it lord kesterton smiled that was not exactly my reason try again lady eleanor knitted her pretty forehead because you thought that harry had the right to know who was to step into his shoes her host shook his head lady eleanor smiled because i am a very charming young woman i do not deny that that had something to do with my breach of confidence but there was still another and better reason then i cannot guess it will you give it up lady eleanor nodded i venture to tell you this state secret whispered lord kesterton to his pretty guest because the fact is already announced in the evening paper end of prologue chapter one of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by marianne concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter one childish things as fays and elves and witches old to children of a gentler mould angels and devils came their way and were adapted to their play a quaint old town which had long ago ceased to be anything but picturesque but which never forgot that it had once been prosperous as some women never forget that they have once been pretty a town in which the square red brick houses pretended that they were frowning on the streets in front while they were really smiling on the gardens at the back all the time a town with an interesting past and a most uneventful present such was chaford in the county of mercer a noticeable figure in the town of chaford a man of courtly manners cultivated mind and consistent piety a scholar moreover of no mean order whose learning was profound and whose wisdom was not of this world such was mark seaton a minister of the people called methodists in the days of his youth the rev mark seaton had chosen as his wife ruth the only daughter of david crashaw of camchester well known among the methodists of the past generation as a leading friend and mrs seaton had inherited a fortune from her father in addition to many gifts of mind and person as she had been a dutiful daughter so she was a devoted wife to her children she was ever sympathetic and tender with intermittent attacks of discipline which she disliked as much as they did and while her heart was ever begging her to indulge her conscience kept bidding her to punish them she had been known to whip her darlings urged by a painful sense of duty thereto but on such sad occasions she wore a shawl for the rest of the day just as she did when the minister was not well or when any important member of the congregation died mark and ruth seaton had only two children paul and joanna by name joanna was the elder by a year but paul was so much the bigger and stronger and better looking of the two that he took the lead in everything 
paul and joanna seaton were brought up in the good old methodist style and learned to take life seriously to them every trivial choice was a decision between good and evil every fortunate accident a special interposition of providence on their behalf they were early taught by their father that the only two things of importance in this life are salvation and education likewise that the verb to be is of infinite moment the verb to do of great weight and the verb to have of no significance at all therefore whatever faults and failings they might suffer from in after life there was no possibility of the little setons becoming vulgar it was when the setons travelled in the chaffered circuit that paul and joanna formed their friendship with alice martin alice was three years younger than joanna and two years younger than paul it was true that she was not as clever as joanna but then she was much prettier which made it all right and in childish days as in later ones alice martin was always ready to play inferior parts in a grateful spirit a habit of mind which makes people to be beloved if downtrodden by their fellow creatures alice's parents were wealthy and worldly persons of being the former they were proud and of being the latter they were ignorant in fact they imagined that they were a very godly couple because they attended chapel regularly and had their library lined with calf-bound copies of the methodist magazine dating from its arminian days mr and mrs martin regarded religion very much as they regarded an english manufacture or an irish industry that is to say they lost no opportunity of patronizing and advertising it but felt that in so doing they were conferring a favor and meriting a vote of thanks mrs martin was an extremely amusing woman but she herself had no idea of this she imagined she was only dignified and edifying she once said although my husband is a rich man and a country magistrate he has the fear of the lord before his eyes and she had no idea that there was anything humorous in this use of the conjunction although another great friend of the minister's children was edgar ford an earnest little boy who was always asking profound and unanswerable questions his father was an opulent merchant and his mother an elegant and well-bred woman who hid great kindness of heart under a somewhat cold and stately exterior but perhaps the most important figure in the children's world while they were yet children was their old nurse martha a very superior and excellent person who had lived with mrs seaton before her marriage martha had another servant under her but she would share with no one the delightful duty of looking after paul and joanna it was martha who corrected their childish sins and comforted their childish sorrows and it was martha who placed them upon an intimate yet withal comfortable footing with the principalities and powers of the spiritual world to martha they owed their ineradicable belief that an inclination to idleness or disobedience or greediness was no mere instinct but a suggestion of the evil one himself who bat-winged and cloven-footed as he appeared in the illustrations to the pilgrim's progress lurked in the dark places of the china pantry and the back stairs for the set purpose of betraying to destruction the souls of the minister's children likewise they were taught that the subdual of this inclination was no mere outcome of a line of plain living high-thinking ancestors but a triumph of the powers of light over the powers of darkness these beliefs paul and joanna never outgrew which perhaps accounted for the fact that as man and woman they did not underestimate the difference between good and evil at chaford paul and joanna spent three of the interminable years of childhood and chaford chapel was ever afterwards associated in their minds with all that is sacred and holy it was there that they had first touched the fringe of the unseen and caught glimpses of life's deeper meanings it was there that they had sung the old-fashioned hymns to the old-fashioned tunes and had felt as if they themselves were somehow one with the white-robed multitude which no man can number singing the song that the angels cannot learn then the hearts of the children were filled with joy and their eyes with tears and a strange thrill ran through the whole of their being they did not understand why they felt so gloriously happy and yet wanted to cry for they were then too young to know that earth and probably heaven has nothing better to offer us than that same thrill which runs through us when we catch fleeting glimpses of the beautiful and the true and rise superior for the time being to all that is sordid and cowardly and mean for the moment we are pure in heart and therefore either through the interpretation of art or the revelation of nature 
either in the loyalty of a great people or in the love of a familiar face, we see God. When Paul and Joanna were respectively eighteen and nineteen, their father's health gave way, and he was obliged to sit down, a synonym among Methodist ministers for retiring upon half pay, and he chose Chaford as the spot where he would finally settle. The Setons had spent their three years at Chaford, some time previously, and it had suited them so well that they selected it as their permanent abode. There is no doubt that the Methodist system of having a sort of general post among the ministry, every conference keeps the church together in a most successful way, but there is also no doubt that a triennial removal falls heavily upon the women of the minister's households. No Wesleyan minister can stay longer than three years in any circuit, and he need only stay one. So, like the Mohammedans and their Hagira, all his race reckons time by conference. There was a nomadic strain in Joanna's blood, inherited from three generations of preaching ancestry, and she was incapable of feeling happy under any roof-tree for a longer period than three years. But her mother was of a less restless disposition, and had learnt that if one is continually moving one's lairs and pernates, these idols are apt to get very much the worse for wear, if not actually broken to pieces. It is only when a Wesleyan minister sits down that his family are able to thoroughly understand the meaning of the word home. Therefore Mrs. Seaton rejoiced in secret over her house at Chaford. Her husband's health was not such as to give her any real anxiety, but he was growing too old for full work and needed rest. And the fortune that she had brought to him made him feel that he was justified in taking, with a clear conscience, the repose for which he craved. Paul was doing very well at Kingswood School, and Joanna was doing equally well in the school of domestic life, and their parents' cup of joy was full when at last Paul won a scholarship at Oxford. On the morning when Paul's triumph had been made known at home, Mrs. Seaton went into the kitchen after breakfast to break the glad news to Martha. But the latter met her with a most ominous expression of countenance. "'There's a sad thing happened this morning, ma'am, and no mistake,' she began with a profound sigh. "'Indeed, Martha, and what is that?' inquired her mistress. "'The best hot water jug has gone to its long home.' "'Oh, Martha, not the Ruth and Naomi one.' "'The very same, ma'am. More's the pity.' Now it happened that this hot water jug was one of Mrs. Seaton's most cherished household gods. It portrayed the first chapter of the book of Ruth. Ruth and Naomi claved to each other under the shadow of the spout, while Orpha, returned to her own people in the direction of the handle. The handle itself was one gigantic ear of barley, and on the opposite side of it to that, where Orpha and her people evidently dwelt, Boaz reaped with his young men, neatly dressed as English farm laborers. "'However did it happen?' asked Mrs. Seaton, in a reproachful tone. "'I was just carrying it with the breakfast cups across the kitchen, and suddenly it smashed itself to bits on the floor.' "'But, Martha,' I've so often told you not to try to carry so many things at once. It was sure to end in an accident. So you have, ma'am, but it seemed as if it was to be. It would not have happened if you had done as I told you, said Mrs. Seaton quite sternly. That is true, ma'am, but it seemed as if it was to be. Nothing that her mistress said could convince Martha that she was in any way to blame for the matter. She seemed to regard herself as merely the instrument in a foreordained scheme of destruction, and kept repeating in a tone of grim satisfaction. It seemed as if it was to be. Mrs. Seaton had learned many things in life, and one of them was that feminine argument is always unattractive and generally useless. She was a woman of infinite tact, and took great pains never to hurt people, or even to make them uncomfortable. Her instinct told her what places were sore to the touch, and her religion prevented her from touching the same. She was too good a woman to rejoice secretly at other people's misfortunes, and too clever a one openly to pity them. But all this did not come by nature to Mrs. Seaton. It had taken half a lifetime's experience, and also considerable knowledge, to bring her tact to the state of perfection. On the present occasion she changed the subject by saying, "'We have had good news about Master Paul this morning, Martha.' "'Indeed, ma'am, that is a good hearing. What has come to the dear lad?' He has won a scholarship at Oxford, and so is going to the university. Well, ma'am, that is good news, and no mistake. Oxford is a fine place, I hear, and I am told that there is a chapel belonging to each of the colleges, so that the dear young gentleman will not be cut off from the means of grace. 
Mrs. Seaton smiled. The college chapels are not Methodist chapels, however. Are they not, ma'am? Well, that's a pity. I thought they were. Still, any sort of a chapel is better than a church, to my thinking. And Mrs. Seaton listened with much amusement while Martha further expounded her views on the subject. So Paul Seaton went to Oxford, and drank deep into the spirit of a city whose very lawns have to be rolled for five hundred years before they are considered soft enough to walk upon. And there Paul saw visions and dream dreams, and because he had been vouchsafed two of the best gifts wherewith Providence can equip a man, namely a religious training and a sense of humor, his dreams were never ignoble and his visions never absurd. He made up his mind to serve God and his generation to the best of his ability, and to make for himself a great name into the bargain, for he was as yet young enough to concoct plans for the conflagration of the river Thames, not knowing that if a man can kindle a fire on his own hearthstone to keep him warm in his old age, he has done his share towards the heating apparatus of this world, and can count himself among the more successful half of mankind. Paul also grew lean and tall and vigorous, and was very pleasant to look upon, with his dark hair, gray eyes, and well-cut face. He was not a handsome man, strictly speaking, but, as Martha said, he would pass in a crowd, and he was quite good-looking enough for everyday use. The years had not dwelt quite as kindly with Joanna as with Paul. She was short and thin and colorless, one of those whitey-brown threads of women who are constantly being overlooked by their friends and neighbors, and whose natural abode is supposed to be the outlying districts of other people's lives. And she took no pains to make herself attractive, as a vainer girl would have done, for she was as yet young enough to cherish that admirable and false belief that folks love us according to our excellencies. We all begin life well grounded in this groundless faith, and we rejoice in it as long as we are youthful enough to fancy that our excellencies will be many. But as we grow older and see how few of these there be, and those not of the finest water, we thank heaven for showing us that the aforesaid dogma was nothing but the rankest heresy. Joanna was the raw material out of which nuns and sisters of mercy are made. Had she belonged to a different faith in a different age, she would have developed into a model lady abbess. To her, love was a matter of no interest. It formed no part of the program of life. Such romance as her nature possessed had been lavished upon Mrs. Cozier, the wife of one of the ministers in her father's penultimate circuit. No lover ever adored his mistress, and no devotee his saint, more absorbingly than Joanna adored Mrs. Cozier. There is always something pathetic in the adoration of a young girl for an older woman. She gives so much, and can of necessity receive so little, Yet, with the exception of motherhood, it is perhaps the most unselfish affection which a woman's life can hold. The girl worships with her whole heart, and pours out all the early romance of her nature on this particular shrine, and the woman either suffers the devotion patiently, or snubs it cruelly, according as she happens to be amiable or the reverse. Mrs. Crozier was kind to Joanna on the whole, but she had not much time to waste on girls, for she was a busy woman. There are some people who go through life putting all of their eggs into one basket. There are others who avoid this mistake, but fall into the equally unlucky one of putting their eggs into baskets which are already full. These erring mortals pour out the treasures of their love at the feet of those whose coffers are overflowing, and spend their days in the thankless task of waiting upon such as are well served. Joanna Seaton was one of these. It was her fate in life to give love where she could only receive friendship, and friendship where she could only receive toleration. Had she given otherwise and other where, her rewards might have been different. But what man or woman can bestow their affection as their wisdom prompts? Therefore there was a tragic element in Joanna's lot. But when gorgeous tragedy puts off her sceptered pall and dresses like a dowdy little spinster, men are too blind to recognize and too hard to pity her so she bears her burden in silence. "'What do you mean to do when you leave Oxford?' asked Joanna of Paul one day. "'I shall take a first and go to the bar, and then into Parliament,' replied her brother promptly. Paul always knew his own mind, a branch of knowledge which is useful in this world. "'But suppose you fail,' suggested Joanna. "'I shall not fail.' "'How do you know that?' "'Because I have made up my mind not to fail, but to work at things till I succeed,' When a man is a failure, it is always his own fault. Except when it is God's, and then failure is better than success, said Joanna quietly, 
who knew more about failure and therefore more about success than paul did he had still to learn that the man who tries and succeeds is one degree less of a hero than the man who fails and yet goes on trying mr martin did not at all approve of paul seaton's going to oxford nominally because he upheld that learning was a dangerous thing for a young man who had his own living to get and actually because he could not bear any one else to enjoy such advantages of mind body or estate as had not been vouchsafed in still fuller measure to himself he therefore spoke a word of warning to the young man one day when paul happened to be calling at the cedars the martin's house was called the cedars because there happened to be a yew tree in the middle of the lawn my dear paul mr martin began i trust that the purely intellectual life in which you are now indulging will in no way unfit you for earning your own living in a suitable and becoming way nor on the other hand lead you to infidelity paul likewise hoped not and said so to my mind interpolated mrs martin there are few more delusive snares than learning falsely so called this excellent lady had no taste for art or literature and consequently she considered them wrong it is so easy and pleasant to discover sins lurking in the pursuits for which we are not inclined many of us possess wonderful powers of perception in this matter my fear always is that classics and mathematics and rubbish of this kind will disable a man for the more serious business of life continued mr martin and render him incapable of making and earning money but don't you think that they might rather enable a man to earn his own living suggested paul mr martin shook his head such things might enable him to earn his own living perhaps but never to make a fortune is it absolutely necessary to human happiness to make a fortune i wonder queried paul now mr martin was a very good-tempered man and the causes of his amiable attitude of mind were twofold he was very well off and he was always sure he was in the right so he had no grounds for a quarrel with anybody but when people spoke slightingly of the good things of this world he was much shocked he called it tempting providence wealth is the hallmark of success he replied rather shortly and poverty is the outward and visible sign of failure i can hardly agree with you there mr martin who ever thinks about how much money shakespeare or milton made mr martin regarded this remark as childish so took no notice of it but calmly continued i once knew a man who began life as an errand boy and yet when he died he left half a million of money behind him now that is what i call a success and i once knew a man who began life as a free-born citizen of no mean city and was executed as a prisoner at rome and who left no fortune behind him save a few letters yet the word hardly calls that man a failure and don't you think it is a little irreverent to apply things out of the bible to everyday life suggested mrs martin in a reproachful tone it always grates upon my ear when i hear young people do it it never struck me in that light i fear added the master of the cedars that too much learning is already leading you to infidelity and causing you to speak flippantly of sacred matters as i said before i cannot commend useless study in my opinion if a man has any time to spare from his business he should devote it to religion as you have done caleb remarked his appreciative spouse i have always endeavoured to do so my dear and that i take it is the reason why my investments are almost invariably successful mr martin was one of the men who acted upon their convictions early in life he had undertaken the difficult task of combining the service of god and mammon for some ten hours a day he worked hard at making and amassing money but his off time he devoted conscientiously to heaven and he considered that on the whole heaven had nothing to complain of in the arrangement it is but fair to add that caleb martin endeavoured according to his lights to do his duty to both the powers under whom he served but if the two interests did happen to clash it was never mammon that came short otherwise perhaps he would not have been such a rich man my husband has never cared for pleasure continued mrs martin and many a time when i considered that a little relaxation would be good for him he has said to me my religion is my recreation sarah and he has always made it so i have indeed replied mr martin modestly though i do not think my dear that you should thus proclaim my virtues upon the housetop it may seem just a little boastful to one not of our own household both mr and mrs martin considered that the latter's description of her husband was unadulterated praise 
it never occurred to either of them that any one in heaven or on earth would not consider it as such it also never occurred to them that they were being at all humorous you have certainly succeeded even beyond your deserts mr martin remarked paul with much sincerity the excellent caleb waved his hand in a deprecatory manner i have received my penny a day he replied neither more nor less as a matter of fact he was at that moment receiving about nineteen pounds nineteen shillings and eleven pence more than his penny a day but it never does to press a metaphor too far then mrs martin chimed in with a remark you will do well to think upon mr martin's words my dear paul at oxford you are doubtless exposed to other pernicious influences in addition to that of infidelity as you are thrown much with young persons who have been nurtured in the pride of high rank and of noble blood a most subtle and dangerous form of sin to my thinking paul much regretted that joanna was not present she always appreciated mrs martin so warmly and she had frequently called attention to the fact now on evidence that in the spiritual world the special dangers which beset our neighbours seem so much more terrible than those which beset ourselves the latter are but pardonable weaknesses we think but the former are mortal sins thus we pray that we may be delivered from pitfalls which have no attraction for us and we hope that providence will be so much engaged in attending to the fulfilments of this prayer that our slips and stumbles into the little hollows which we affect will pass unnoticed pride of birth is a dreadful besetment continued mrs martin and one which i pray may never be laid to my charge which certainly seemed an almost superfluous petition considering the lineage of the suppliant the martins were very anxious to be delivered from the temptations arising from such mundane blessings as had been denied them but it never seemed to occur to them to pray for exemption from the love of money i suppose all worldly gifts become besetments if we give them primary instead of secondary place suggested paul and if we confuse essentials with non-essentials uh, quite so quite so agreed mr martin and it is this thought which gives us parents so much anxiety when we look forward into our children's future this fear that the young people may in their ignorance fling away the substance for the sake of the shadow as a young friend of mine once did who refused a partnership in an excellent business in order to become a missionary what happened to him eventually asked paul mr martin heaved a sigh of sincere regret he died a comparatively young man somewhere in the south seas and if he had taken my advice and stayed at home he might have been the mayor of his native town by this time but young folks will not be controlled still i can't help thinking that on the whole it is as fine a thing to be a martyr as to be a mayor paul remarked but mr martin considered this remark irreverent mr martin is right sighed the mistress of the cedars though for my part i desire for my one ewe lamb neither riches nor honour i ask only that she may be wise and happy and then the conversation was interrupted by the entrance of alice who blushed very becomingly on perceiving paul while mrs martin having noted the blush was straightway plunged into a very maelstrom of maternal unrest lest the one ewe lamb for whom she desired neither riches nor honour should seek happiness with the impernicious son of a minister of religion End of chapter one Chapter two of Concerning Isabel Carnaby This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell Concerning Isabel Carnaby by Ellen Thornycraft Fowler Chapter two Alice I will own you as my prince in the sight of heaven, for I have loved you ever since I was six or seven. In consequence of her daughter's incriminating blush, Mrs. Martin set herself to the not uncommon task of locking a stable door after the steed had been stolen, but it was too late. Alice loved Paul Seaton, and felt that to be with him and to hear his voice was ideal happiness as for paul he liked his old playmate because she thought him infallible and because she was pleasant to look upon but his time for love was not yet men and women approach the great subject of love 
by such different roads the normal woman begins her life by raising an altar to an unknown god and dedicates it to the first handsome stranger who comes her way as the niche over the shrine is generally what shopkeepers call dock size worship is the leading motive of her existence the particular idol whom she happens to adore is a mere matter of circumstance but with a man it is different in his case the goddess appears prior to the altar and it is only after he has met and fallen down before the one that he recognizes the necessity of erecting the other alice martin was an extremely pretty girl and reminded one of a picture by romney with her soft brown hair and eyes to match she was also sweet and good and restful and possessed the power of making happy any man who happened to love her she also possessed the power of loving almost any man provided that he was kind and agreeable and always on the spot for let poets and novelists say what they will in favor of manly beauty and manly prowess it is not the man of war or the man of genius that carries the day with the majority of women but the man who happens to be on the spot i don't think miss alice is looking well do you martha asked joanna of her faithful handmaid one day far from it miss far from it i passed the remark only the other day to mrs martin's cook that miss alice had just the same look that my niece karen opsuch tozer had and in three weeks after that karen opsuch was the corpse asserted martha cheerfully joanna suppressed a smile oh i don't think she is as bad as that martha but she looks to me as if she were fretting about something maybe she is my dear the heart knoweth its own bitterness as solomon said and a wounded spirit is as a broken tooth as it were i sometimes wonder if she is in love with paul remarked paul's sister thoughtfully well to be sure miss what an idea yet master paul is a likely enough lad for any maid to fancy bless his heart falling in love seems such a great bother don't you think martha i should just think it is my dear and no mistake i'm thankful to say i always kept clear of rubbish of that kind i've had too much to do what with preparing your dear papa's meals and keeping the circuit's furniture in good order to waste my time to think of men and love and fall-alls of that sort i have made up my mind that i shall never marry said joanna and i for one don't blame you for what with throwing matches into the grates and walking on the carpets with muddy boots and sitting on the antimacassars and crumpling them up there's nothing makes as much dirt in a house as a man they are far worse than dogs or children in my opinion besides mused joanna i am not pretty enough to get married bless you my dear that's neither here nor there if providence ordains that you'll be married married you'll be if you've got a face like a turnip and a figure like a bolster as i once passed the remark to my sister eliza ann eliza ann says i you're the plainest woman i ever set eyes on and you've got the best husband which was nothing short of a miracle joanna smiled did not eliza ann feel hurt at your saying that ah oh, not she eliza ann was far too godly a woman to care for such an earthly snare as beauty or to spend her days in plaiting her hair and putting on of apparel like the beast that perish where is eliza ann now asked joanna she went with her husband to australia some years ago do you often hear from her now and again miss when she has the time but what with one thing and another her days are pretty full she and her husband wanted me to go out and join them at one time but i said that unless they could promise that i could sleep every night on land in a four-post bed i would not undertake the journey it may be all very well to go traveling by day when you can see where you are going to but traveling by night is only for such as love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil joanna seaton had an admirable sense of humor and therefore always encouraged martha when the latter was inclined 
like the moon to take up her wondrous tale and relate the story of her earlier experiences your sister eliza ann must have been a woman of strong character said joanna suggestively indeed she was my dear and no mistake she was such a leading light in the grampton circuit that it was considered due to her piety to ask her to do the cutting out at the dorcas meeting but piety and cutting out don't always go together more's the pity i suppose they don't far from it there was once great distress in grampton owing to bad trade coupled with a deep snow and brother phipson gave a roll of cloth to make clothes for ragged little boys brother phipson being a cloth merchant by nature and a circuit steward by grace it was very kind of him to give garments to the poor said joanna approvingly he was but an unprofitable servant like the rest of us sighed martha when we have done all we can our righteousness is but filthy rags hanging on barren fig trees did your sister cut out all the little boy's clothes well it was this way miss eliza ann was such a saint that it would not have been seemly for any other member of the congregation to do the cutting out while she was present so she was appointed to the work but her mind was so full on the last sunday evening sermon that she cut out all the trousers for the same leg joanna laughed outright i suppose she was in a great way when she found out what she had done not she my dear replied martha somewhat reprovingly eliza ann was far too religious a woman to own to anybody but her maker that she had been in the wrong then what did she do she said what she had done she had done for the best but it was always her fate to be misunderstood so she supposed she must take it as her cross and not complain she had endeavoured not to let her left hand know what her right hand was doing and this was the consequence oh she was terribly hurt was eliza ann and no wonder when the young minister told her that according to his ideas trousers like opinions should not be one-sided it was so painful she said when men reviled her and condemned her after she had acted as she thought for the best what was the end of it all joanna asked the end was miss that brother phipson heard what had happened and gave another roll of cloth to make the other legs so that all things worked together for good and there was double the number of pairs that there would have been if the cutting out had not been done by eliza ann she really must have been a gifted person oh eliza ann was a godly woman and no mistake confessed martha with pardonable pride and still is i doubt not a sea voyage having no power to change the human heart but she was none too easy to get on with when things were going smooth though i say it as shouldn't being her sister there were times when eliza ann's religion was trying to the flesh of them she had to do with did her husband think it so queried joanna oh my dear what a question to ask as if it mattered what he thought eliza ann was far too sensible to allow him to give his opinion about anything if you let a husband begin to pass remarks she used to say it is the thin end of the wedge which in time will turn again and rend you so eliza ann avoided the first appearance of evil but she was really good you say good my dear of course she was good who ever thought anything different exclaimed martha who had never read milton's line he for god only she for god in him and would have called it rubbish if she had i assure you miss eliza ann was not one to keep the outside of the cup and platter clean while the inside was filled with ravening wolves and dead men's bones though she might be aggravating as it were in times of prosperity in the day of adversity she never failed nor fell short joanna nodded now in the case of mr sweeting continued martha him that so far forgot himself as to say that trousers should be two-sided you know as long as he waxed fat and kicked and was filled with pride and vainglory eliza ann would have nothing to say to him but when he fell sick of the smallpox 
and there was no woman to look after him, his mother being dead, and his stepmother living at such a distance, and caring more for the things of this life than for her husband's first family, which was all sons, Eliza Ann went and nursed him herself, and if it had not been for her, the poor young man would have died. "'Did she escape the infection?' asked Joanna anxiously. "'Not she. As soon as Mr. Sweeting was pretty well, Eliza Ann caught the complaint and had a terrible time. And when she got well again, she found her face was disfigured and her beautiful hair all cut off. "'Oh, how sad!' cried Joanna. "'Was she pretty before her illness?' Uh, no my dear far from it she was always a plain woman at the best of times but the smallpox left her positively ugly she really had had beautiful hair but when it grew again it all came gray perhaps her hair being her one beauty might have proved a snare to her so the lord saw fit to remove it lest she herself having saved others should become a castaway did she mind much when she found her face was all disfigured? Joanna asked. And did she regret what she had done? Never once, miss. Eliza Ann is not one of the regretting sort. She does what she thinks right, and leaves Providence to take the consequences. The first time I saw her after her illness, My conscience alive, Eliza Ann, says I. You are a figure of fun. Martha, says she, the Lord called me to nurse that poor misguided young man, and was I going to let the thought of my vile body come between me and the Lord's work? That's how Eliza Ann looked at the matter, and it was the sensible view to my thinking. Joanna's eyes filled with tears. Self-sacrifice, even in Eliza Ann's, always touched her. I hope you said something comforting to your sister, Martha. Yes, miss, I did, and something edifying, too, I trust. Eliza Ann, says I, if you have been ugly here, you will be handsome enough in heaven, never fear. Much beauty you never had, but such as it was, you gave it to the Lord, and he will pay it back in his own good time. Then you think that what we give up here will be made up to us hereafter? Certainly so, replied Martha cheerfully. The Lord tells us in his holy word to owe no man anything, so it isn't likely that he will remain in debt himself. Trust him. If we give him our health or wealth or beauty, it will be repaid some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundredfold. I wonder if we shall all be beautiful in heaven, said Joanna. Of course we shall, my dear, if we want to be, replied Martha. If the Lord lets us wish for anything very much, he means to fulfill that wish, either in this world or the next, or else he would never let us go on wishing it. Then do you think that every one will be made good-looking in heaven? I do, Miss Joanna. It will be a big job with some of us, I admit. But the Lord will manage it, never fear. Still, it seems wrong and selfish somehow to wish very much for beauty, persisted Joanna, who, being younger and less wise than her mother, was addicted to argument. Mrs. Martin was talking about this the other day, and she said she considered the mere desire to be beautiful was a form of sinful vanity. Perhaps she is of a contented disposition, and has brought her mind to her circumstances, as the saying is, suggested Martha, who always scented battle at the mere mention of Mrs. Martin. This excellent lady had a wonderful knack of teaching people their place, a form of education which does not add to the popularity of the instructor. She said that wealth was a higher gift than beauty, continued Joanna thoughtfully, because it could be used for the benefit of others, while beauty was only a personal possession. And she told me that she had often felt it right to pray to the Lord for riches, because she needed them to carry out his work. She never took him in with that, I'll be bound, murmured Martha, with an ominous shake of the head. But it was just like her to try it on. I suppose we ought not to mind whether we are rich or poor, or handsome or plain, mused Joanna aloud. For this life is, after all, 
only an anteroom to the next one. Our happiness or unhappiness here is really a question of no moment. What really matters is whether we are using our happiness or unhappiness as a fit preparation for the life to come. Quite true, my dear, commented Martha. As long as sick folk get well, it doesn't signify to them whether they are cured by sweet syrups or by bitter drugs. It is the cure that matters, not the medicine. Joanna nodded her head approvingly. Martha's uncompromising sense of justice always appealed to her. "'Them as think too much of this present life and all its vanities,' continued Martha, "'remind me of my poor father the first time he travelled by rail. "'It was to see his sister who lived in Folwich. "'Now, Joshua,' says Mother to him, "'whatever you do, don't sit down on them comfortable seats and fall asleep, "'but remember that you are a stranger and a sojourner.' "'All right, missus,' says Father. "'And then, like a man, did exactly the opposite to what he'd been told. "'Oh, they are tiresome creatures, men are. "'If you look after their health, they say you are fussy. "'And if you don't, they are all dead corpses. "'Hey, but there is no peace for a married woman, save in the grave. "'And not even there, I doubt, unless he has been took first, "'and so she knows he is out of harm's way.' "'Then don't you think that men are able to take care of themselves?' asked Joanna. "'My conscience alive, miss! "'You who have got a father of your own to ask such a question as that. "'Still, there is some excuse for you, "'seeing that your father is a minister, and so not quite like other men. "'But even the call to the ministry don't make a man equal to a woman to my thinking, "'though it is better than nothing, as you may say.' "'What happened to your father on his first journey? "'That is what you were telling me.' "'So I was, miss, so I was. "'Well, as I was saying, "'mother told father not to make himself too comfortable on his journey, "'or worse would come of it. "'She owned afterwards that she had been foolish "'not to see that forbidding a thing "'was just like suggesting to him to do it, "'and putting fresh mischief into his head.' For the moment she forgot she was speaking to a man, and treated him as a reasonable being, which she ought to have known better, being a married woman. Then did he disobey her, inquired Joanna. Naturally, my dear, he did. No sooner did father start on his journey out of reach of mother's eye, than he sat down on them seats and went fast asleep, and he didn't wake up again till he'd gone five stations past Fulwich. Oh, dear! It was, oh dear, and no mistake, for he had to wait at Brayford four hours for the next train back, and then had to come straight home again without seeing his sister at all, besides having to pay the extra fare, which came to five and threepence. Mother said he was a type of them that have their portion in this life, and are so busy making the best of the wilderness that they pass by the promised land without even seeing the name of the station. So Joanna and her old nurse, like the true Methodists that they were, talked familiarly together about holy things, and this familiarity arose not from any lightness or irreverence, but from the fact that to them such things were so near and so real that they became as household words. The Methodists of the past generation lived always with their lamps lit and their loins girded, as those that wait for their Lord and they sought so diligently for the true that they had no leisure to look for the beautiful, for it had not yet been revealed to them that the true and the beautiful are one. They were so fearful of confounding the substance with the shadow that they did not altogether realize that the shadow is, after all, but the reflection of the substance, and therefore a revelation of the same. And they gazed so steadfastly into heaven that they were in danger of forgetting how God had made the earth as well as the heavens, and saw that it was good. To their ears there was no message in the wind or the earthquake or the fire, but they heard clearly the still, small voice, and they did whatsoever it commanded them. And we need not pity them overmuch that some of the beauty and poetry of life was hid from their eyes, they that seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness know no abiding lack. 
for all these things shall be added unto them. Now it happened that Martha was not the only person who had noticed Alice's delicate appearance. Alice's mother had likewise perceived it, and it had struck a cold chill to the maternal heart. For human nature is stronger than worldly ambition or religious prejudice, is stronger, in fact, than most things, and human nature has much that is good in it, as well as much that is not quite so good. Therefore Mrs. Martin's comfortable view of life, with an equally comfortable view of heaven in the background, lost all its beauty and symmetry when her careful eye perceived a tiny hollow appearing in Alice's cheek. Nevertheless, the hollow remained, as Paul Seaton his mark, and Mrs. Martin was powerless to remove it. As for Paul himself, he was much too occupied with books and boating and such important matters to notice whether a girl's cheek were thin or the reverse, and he would have been extremely surprised and annoyed to learn that he possessed the right to excavate in so delicate a field. For in his second year at Oxford, he became captain of his college boat, having proved his prowess on the river, and he was happier then than he had ever been, or probably ever would be again. To Paul Seaton, rowing was no mere pastime. At that time, it was to him a sign and type of all that was best in life and human nature. And though in after years the type changed, the thing which rowing then represented was ever the greatest thing in the world to Paul. I cannot understand how you can care so much about an amusement, said Joanna one day, as she and Paul and Alice were sitting in the garden at the Cedars. Paul flushed. It isn't just an amusement. To me, it is a lot more than that. I don't see how amusement can be anything more than amusement, persisted Joanna. And to care too much about a pastime seems to me as wrong as to care too much about pleasure. Oh, can't you understand, cried her brother. Can't you see that in boating, as in everything else in life, there is considerably more than the thing itself. Of course, rowing is a glorious exercise, and a fellow thoroughly enjoys it. But besides that, there is the esprit de corps, and the desire to have one's boat first on the river, and all that sort of thing, don't you know? I see, said Alice. I don't think you girls realize how awfully it matters to a fellow that his college boat should be first. Why, I've seen men get soaked through and yet forget all about themselves and not care a rap how cold and damp they were, nor how ill they made themselves, as long as their boat won. I know, said Alice. Now, as a matter of fact, Alice did not know one bit better than Joanna did, but she used her eyes much and her tongue little, and consequently had the reputation of being an extremely sympathetic young person. She had a pretty way of looking interested, and of saying, Yes, I know. And women who do these things are beloved both by their own sex and the other. Alice was not insincere in thus doing. Her sympathy extended over a far wider range than her comprehension, and her eyes were truthful in the interest they expressed though her brain did not grasp the why and wherefore of this interest. Alice felt more than she understood, and Joanna understood more than she felt. Consequently, and deservedly, Alice won more love from her kind than Joanna did. For the world is fair to people as a rule, and with what measure they meet it, it is measured to them with all. To a woman, a heart is a more remunerative investment than a head, and a much more satisfactory possession. Yet women are slow to perceive this. If only the women who have sufficient wit to say nasty things had just so much more wit as would prevent them from saying the same, the world would be a pleasanter place, and the men who have married stupid wives would have less cause for self-congratulation than they have at present. For in a woman, as in a lemon, bitterness is an unpardonable defect. Men, on the contrary, like grouse, are all nicer for a flavor of it. 
to me remarked joanna obstinately rowing is merely a violent form of the bodily exercise which profiteth little i cannot see anything else in it i can understand that a man would want his own college to produce the best scholars in the university but i cannot see how it can matter whether his boat's first on the river or not paul groaned it is the firstness that matters don't you see whether it applies to the schools or the river i see no credit in being first in mere physical things said joanna who was small and weak well i do then replied paul who was tall and strong i think it is nice to do things well whether they are physical or mental added alice who was amiable it is awfully jolly to feel you are in good form replied paul pinching his biceps i'd far rather be a genius than the strongest man in the world said his sister would you argued paul i can't say that i would i'd rather have been achilles in the thick of the fight than homer writing about him still success in anything is a fine thing about the finest thing in the world i suppose and it must be glorious for a man to feel himself a head and shoulders above his fellows in any sphere you think too much about success said joanna gravely the greatest thing it seems to me is to do one's duty and not bother about the results i can imagine failures being a better thing than success under certain circumstances paul shrugged his shoulders well i can't and at any rate i hope my portion in life will be the inferior one you call success i am sure it will be added alice you are so awfully clever that there is no doubt that you will succeed in whatever you undertake just as you have done in the boating which as i have said before doesn't seem to me a sort of success worth having said the unbending joanna joanna labored under a not uncommon delusion that there is a special virtue in upholding any opinion in the face of opposition and that the oftener one reiterates that opinion and the more unacceptable it is the greater is the virtue to the masculine mind this habit of thought is trying and paul found it specially so when it ran right across his boyish enthusiasms though he was as yet too young to know all that he had learnt the river had already taught him more than the schools it had shown him the necessity for self-imposed discipline implicit obedience regular work strong endurance stern self-denial and unity of aim and interest and even if he were unable as yet to realize all this still less to express it joanna's disapproval of his greatest delight partook of the nature of sacrilege in paul's eyes it's no use talking to you of things that you don't understand he said crossly paul's temper like canal bridges never being equal to bearing more than the ordinary traffic of the district i don't wonder that you enjoy rowing so much paul for it must be so nice on the river these lovely afternoons interpolated alice ever ready to make peace but paul was not so easily appeased nice on the river he grumbled what an expression girls never have any idea of anything better or higher than what they call nice which was very unjust as well as very disagreeable for joanna's visions of duty and alice's dreams of love were quite equal from an ethical point of view to paul's heroics but of course paul did not know this if he had he would have been thirty instead of twenty and wise at that if i were a man i should love to be big and strong persisted the peacemaker it seems just as right for a man to be strong as for a woman to be beautiful i wonder if beautiful women are much happier than plain ones remarked joanna of course they are replied alice because people love them more and love is the only thing that really makes a woman happy joanna shook her head i don't see that your own people will love you whether you are plain or whether you are pretty 
and it seems to me to have a lot of outsiders fond of you would be a bother rather than a pleasure. But don't you like people to be fond of you? asked Alice. Not unless I am fond of them. When comparative strangers kiss me and gush over me, I feel so dreadfully uncomfortable I don't know what to do. There was a very gushing woman in our last circuit who used to hold my hand for hours together. I shouldn't have minded that, said Alice. Joanna laughed. But I did. I was simply paralyzed with terror. Every time she gave my hand a squeeze, I squeezed back. And if my squeeze hadn't been quite as hard as hers, I felt as if I were in debt and ought to be county courted. Paul was dreadfully bored by this style of conversation. He was not sufficiently in love with Alice to care to discuss emotions with her. For a man does not like to talk about feelings, except to the woman he happens to be in love with. And then he only does it to please her, and wishes to goodness she would select some other topic. It was a very happy life at Chaford just then, especially to Joanna. Each day was full, but not too full of duties, and nearly every evening there was some mild religious excitement to take the minister's family out and prevent life from ever seeming dull. There were the week evening service, and the class meeting, and the prayer meeting, and the Dorcas meeting, four full nights for certain, and there often came little irregular and extra means of grace for the other evenings of the week so that every day there was the pleasant feeling that something was going to happen after tea. This cheerful and busy type of existence exactly suited Joanna. It satisfied her completely, and she had no longings for anything different, neither much patience with the people who had. But Alice dreamed dreams of a fuller life, which was not hers at all, but Paul's. A life devoted to adoring Paul when he succeeded, and adoring him still more when he failed. She was content to stand afar off among the crowd who were eager to crown Paul as victor in the days of his triumph. If only she might have the right to come near and comfort him in times of failure and humiliation. She fully believed that Paul was one of the greatest men alive, and would prove himself such to the world in general. But she would not have loved him a whit less, but rather more, had she thought him doomed to fail in everything that he undertook. Paul was Paul. That was enough for her. If the world did not do him justice, so much the worse for the world. As for Paul himself, he knew nothing of Alice's girlish devotion to him, and would not have thanked her for it if he had. He meant to succeed. So the love that beareth all things and never faileth was not an article for which he had any use. The admiration that success was bound to command was more in his line at present, and that, of course, one demands as one's right and never thanks anybody for. To Paul just then, the love that endures and is patient was as uninteresting as chrysanthemums and china asters would be in the spring. There comes a time when we cherish chrysanthemums and china asters, even of the most ordinary sort. But... That is not till the violets and the roses and the lilies are all faded. End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 of Concerning Isabel Carnaby。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. Concerning Isabel Carnaby by Ellen Thornycraft Fowler. Chapter 3 Two Kings in Brentford. I'll take your part when you are wrong. I'll fight your battles to the end. I'll listen when you sing a song and never count your tales too long because you are are my friend. It has a very pretty effect in dancing the lancers when the dancers set to corners. But when our hearts and the affections thereof take it upon themselves to perform this particular figure, the effect is not so satisfactory. 
yet it is a figure towards the dancing of which these members much incline therefore it happened that while alice martin was breaking her heart for love of paul seaton edgar ford was breaking his for love of alice martin surely fate when fate is pleased to be ironical displays a most ingenious and whimsical sense of humour and it happened that fate was just now sharpening this particular sense at the expense of mr and mrs martin this worthy couple generally liked things to be done at their expense it sounded so lavish and princely but this was carrying matters a little too far paul being poor was anathema to mr and mrs martin and edgar being rich was their heart's desire and yet alice loved paul and was indifferent to edgar and in consequence there appeared that disturbing little hollow in alice's pretty cheek the fords were the most important people in chafford and had been rich merchants there for several generations edgar's great-grandfather was a friend of john wesley's and the great little man had preached the gospel under the huge cedar on the lawn of chafford house consequently at chafford chapel the fords sat in the farthest back pew this being ever considered the most august seat the woolsack in fact of methodist chapels and their place in the sanctuary was rendered yet more glorious by a brazen fence wherefrom dangled a sort of short red moreen petticoat which ran all along the top of their pew and so screened the prayers of the ford family from the prying and plebeian eyes of the rest of the congregation mrs ford pronounced the open sesame at all the wesleyan bazaars and sales of work within a radius of ten miles round chafford and on such occasions she was specially introduced to the divine notice by the officiating minister under the pseudonym of an handmaid as a child edgar had no idea what this expression exactly meant neither perhaps had the officiating minister but he felt extremely proud of his mother when he heard her alluded to in this way and when the minister's prayer was more than usually embracing and included edgar himself under the title of her offspring edgar's spiritual arrogance knew no bounds if the setons were as the salt of methodism the fords were as the cream of it their social position fitted them for this life and their religious fervor for the next they neither hated the world as did mark seaton nor worshipped it as did caleb martin on the whole they very fairly rendered to caesar the things that were caesar's and to god the things that were god and to do this men must know something about caesar and also something about god edgar was now the only child of the house of ford two little sisters having exchanged earth for heaven and taken their mother's heart along with them like all nonconformist edgar ford inclined to overscrupulousness rather than to laxity he was ready to sacrifice everything to his principles which was right but he sometimes mistook his prejudices for his principles which was tiresome looked at in the light of eternity edgar's conduct was always eminently satisfactory but looked at in the light of earth it was sometimes a little trying a college friend of his once said that ford was suffering from fatty degeneration of the conscience and edgar's conscience certainly was abnormally enlarged when great issues were at stake this extreme and sensitive conscientiousness made edgar ford a prince among men but when one was dealing with less important matters and lawfulness was not so much the question to be considered as expediency edgar's custom of hair-splitting was somewhat paralyzing in its effects he would hardly let himself do right for fear of doing wrong which morbid introspection was partly the result of a puritan training and ancestry and partly of a delicate digestion for the rest edgar was a proper man as one shall see in a summer day 
he was fair and slight and good-looking and the shyness and sensitiveness which caused his own feelings to be so often hurt made him specially careful not to hurt other people's he did not talk much but always left one with the impression that he had been extremely interesting though one could not recall a word of what he said his silence was more interesting than most men's conversation and his pride less aggressive than most men's humility yet he was very silent and excessively proud for people in general he cared not at all he was too shy to understand and too sensitive to defy them but for the few for whom he did care his patience was exhaustless and his love unfailing nothing that they might do could estrange them from him martha once remarked when master edgar dies of old age master paul will shake in his shoes which was her cheerful and picturesque way of notifying the fact that edgar was paul senior by only a few months owing to this similarity of age and diversity of temperament a firm friendship had sprung up between the two boys which grew with their growth and strengthened with their strength in every respect these two differed from each other while paul knew neither shyness nor self-consciousness edgar was a prey to both while paul took out his own feelings and examined them and talked about them edgar kept his shut up in the secret chambers of his soul paul was more sure of himself when he was in the wrong than edgar was when he was in the right and while paul was inclined to ride roughshod over other people edgar was as tender as the tenderest woman when paul made up his mind to take a certain path he took it all the more determinedly if there were lions in the way and regarded the worsting of these interfering beasts as the best part of the sport but if there were lions in edgar's way he hesitated about taking that path at all not because he was afraid of lions or of anything else under the sun save sin but because he regarded the presence of these fearful wild foe as a divine intimation that such a path was not for his treading consequently paul possessed the elements of success if by success one means fame and wealth and the getting of one's own way while edgar's was one of the natures foredoomed to failure if by failure one means nothing in this world but knowledge of the truth and in the world to come life everlasting which are the common interpretations of the words success and failure as used among men with all the intensity of a deep and refined and somewhat narrow nature edgar ford loved alice he did not inwardly examine himself to see the why and wherefore of his love as paul would have done he merely knew that alice martin was all the world to him and would be so as long as he and the world lasted it was characteristic of the two men that paul analyzed his feelings but took his motives for granted while edgar carefully weighed and examined his principles and left his feelings to take care of themselves knowing that they were strong enough to do that and a good deal more into the bargain edgar always knew what he wanted but not always what he ought to do paul on the contrary always knew what he thought right but not always what he thought desirable now if edgar had been as wise as he was good he would have carried on his love-making regardless of paul and would then and there have won alice for himself and that plan would have been the best for everybody concerned for alice was not capable of holding paul even if she could win him and she was not the woman to make paul happy even if he deluded himself into fancying that he loved her while edgar was quite equal to supplanting paul in alice's affection and making her and himself thereby happy ever after if only he had realized that all is fair in love and war and had set about things in the right way but unfortunately it was not edgar's habit to set about things in the right way first he reasoned with himself that alice's happiness was the great thing to be considered and that alice's happiness was bound up in paul 
for poor edgar's eye had been as quick as mrs martin's to discover that tell-tale little hollow in alice's cheek and that therefore his very love for alice constrained him not to come between her and the thing she coveted then he further decided that as paul's friend he was in honour bound not to stand in paul's light should paul eventually discover how extremely pretty alice was and finally he made up his mind to immolate himself upon the joint altar of love and friendship and it never occurred to him that the flames of his sacrifice were likely to burn up paul and alice's happiness as well as his own in edgar's anxiety to leave alice quite free he strove his utmost to hide from her the fact that he loved her he had an idea that in doing so he was taking the most honourable course towards her and towards paul and he pursued this course with such success that alice thought him stuck up and ill-tempered and confided the same to paul who with more common sense and equally little perception decided that he was only bilious as for paul he had as yet no more idea that edgar cared for alice than that alice cared for himself such things were as yet unknown to him though it was gradually dawning upon him that alice was extremely good-looking and very easy to talk to but the rest of the world were not so blind as paul and even miss drusilla dalicott the spinster par excellence of chafford had some inkling as to how matters stood miss drusilla's mind to her a kingdom was and she prided herself upon the excellence of her diction and the refinement of her style she was a very learned little lady and never used a word of one syllable if a synonym of three could be found in the dictionary she lived entirely in the literature of the past and resolutely refused on any pretext whatever to come down later than the eighteenth century in addition to the kingdom of her mind miss dalicott ruled over a nice fortune of her own and she gave freely to the cause at chafford she was extremely particular in her habits and while her godliness was indisputable her cleanliness was virulent no visitors were allowed to enter her abode until they had been rubbed down with a clothes brush and a duster in the back hall and even then they were rarely admitted into the sanctum of her drawing-room lest they should by their presence soil the chintz covers therein what was to be seen beneath those chintz covers was an impenetrable secret it was rumoured in chafford that grass-green satin was the underlying texture but this was as purely traditional as the site of the garden of eden or the date of the building of babel no living man or woman had seen miss dalicott's drawing-room furniture face to face my dear young friend said miss drusilla to joanna seaton one day when the minister's daughter was having tea with her in her spotless dining-room preparation for the feast having been made by the spreading of a serviette all over the visitor's lap and of a small floor-cloth under the visitor's chair lest an unwary crumb should escape from its moorings and rush headlong on to the carpet. Has it ever presented itself to your imagination that an attachment of a sentimental character might possibly arise between your gifted and talented brother and that amiable young creature, Alice Martin? I believe that Alice thinks Paul very clever, and I know that Paul thinks Alice very pretty, replied Joanna guardedly perhaps it is scarcely seemly of me to introduce so romantic though interesting a subject to a person as yet as youthful and innocent as yourself yet my deep reverence for my spiritual pastor and my sincere attachment to his attractive family cause me to experience the warmest concern in anything which affects either his interest or theirs it is very good of you dear miss delicott to take so friendly an interest in all of us and your kind sympathy is fully appreciated father was saying only yesterday that he counts you among his truest as well as his cleverest friends for he has never been disappointed either in your heart or in your head you know how he enjoys a chat about books with you and how much good it does him your words thus fitly spoken are indeed as apples of gold 
in pictures of silver the praise of so gifted a man as your father is too high a tribute to such feeble powers as i may possess yet the suffrage of one who combines the noble qualities of a true gentleman with the high vocation of a minister of religion is an encouragement to any thoughtful mind to follow his guidance into the realms of knowledge now joanna detested gossip above all things having already learnt that no good can come of it but much evil so she wisely endeavoured to drive her hostess still further into the realms of knowledge so as to keep her from inquisitively wandering into the fields of romance have you been reading anything new lately she asked with much subtlety nay my dear joanna new books and new writers are alike abhorrent to my literary taste and i dislike the one as cordially as i despise the other to me my plato and my aristotle are ever fresh and if i desire to provide my mind with suitable relaxation are not walter scott and jane austen ever at hand to plume my wings for a flight into the world of fiction but don't you think that novels of all kinds provided of course that they are good ones help one to understand human nature you must first prove to me that a fuller understanding of human nature is a consummation devoutly to be wished for my own part i cannot see that it forms a specially interesting or instructive branch of study that human nature is in but a sorry condition at present is my conviction and that it will some day rise to a height unmeasured as yet is my hope but to watch it in its dilatory and intermittent ascent to count its countless failures and to number its innumerable falls is a pastime which does not recommend itself to my intelligence nor render itself attractive to my fancy yet human nature is the most interesting thing and the most important thing in the whole world except divine nature to me my dear joanna too lively an interest in the thoughts and emotions of one's fellow creatures betokens a somewhat frivolous and unstable mind and would be in danger of gradually degenerating into a gossiping habit not becoming nor seemly in a professor of the christian religion joanna looked thoughtful edgar ford says that alice and i talk and think too much about feelings she said and that it is morbid and unhealthy of us and doubtless my dear child there is some truth in the statement sufficient at any rate to warn you against giving unbridled license to a custom which though innocuous at present might eventually develop into a pernicious and dissipating habit of mind edgar ford is a young man of excellent parts as a son he is irreproachable as a friend unexceptionable and that reminds me my love have you ever perceived that he evinces a more tender interest than is consistent with mere friendship in our dear young friend alice martin joanna's eyes opened wide with astonishment good gracious miss drusilla such an idea never entered my head well take note when next you see the handsome young couple in each other's company and i feel certain you will arrive at the conclusion that my suspicion is not without foundation i am sure you are wrong quite wrong edgar never speaks to alice if he can help it in fact i don't think he likes her much alice is not at all clever and edgar thinks so much of cleverness the ways of men are as a sealed book to me and i cannot say that it is my desire ever to have the seals broken yet i have been led to believe that masculine minds are so constituted that mental charms do not appeal to them as powerfully as do mere physical attractions joanna shook her head edgar is different from other men paul might be taken with a pretty face he is so impulsive and impressionable but edgar is too good and wise to care for any woman who would not be a companion to him in all his intellectual interests and pursuits and though alice is very dear and sweet and pretty she is extremely stupid you know 
yet i have heard that even good and wise men will condone the emptiness of a female head on account of the beauty of the face that appertains to it on her way home from miss dalicott's joanna fell in with alice and the two girls walked on together after what a chairman would call a few preliminary remarks joanna blurted out alice do you think that edgar ford admires you miss drusilla says he does joanna had yet to learn that truths like parcels have to be neatly wrapped up before their vendors can dispose of them alice stood still so great was her astonishment oh dear no i'm perfectly certain he doesn't what an absurd idea for that dear old thing to get into her head but she is so busy finding long words that her wits are apt to go wool-gathering don't you think yes i do she was delicious today. I did wish that you and Paul had been there, too. It seemed a pity for her sweetness to be wasted on the desert air of my solitary self. Was she really fine? asked Alice. I should just think she was. She was like a penny a liner and an eighteenth-century poet rolled in one. That really was an idiotic thing to say about Edgar. Because do you know, Joanna, he has been positively horrid to me lately has he yes something awful i can't make out why because i've never been nasty to him that i know of you never are nasty to anybody dear i never want to be said alice i am always so dreadfully anxious to be liked that i try my best to be nice to people and when they don't like me it makes me so wretched that i want to cry i never mind whether people like me or not i wish i didn't sighed alice but i do more than anything well you are so pretty that you are sure of being liked whatever you do people always like pretty women said joanna i don't think so i'd much rather have been clever people get tired of prettiness but they never do of cleverness then do you think it is because you are not clever but only pretty that edgar has got tired of you inquired the blunt joanna showing her inexperience of the ways of men by the use of so absurd an expression as only pretty i don't think that explains it of course i know that edgar would not care much for anybody as stupid as i am but i think it is horrid of him to positively dislike me for not being clever it really isn't my fault i try awfully hard to be clever but i find it so difficult to understand things and edgar is generally so just to people and so tender to their feelings that it makes it all the nastier for me but are you sure he positively dislikes you perhaps you only bore him suggested joanna oh i should not be a bit surprised if i bored him in fact i should be surprised if i did anything else most people bore edgar you know and yet he is always kind and courteous to them and isn't he kind and courteous to you alice's pretty eyes filled with tears no he isn't and that shows how much he must hate me he is more civil to his mother's housekeeper than he is to me and i mind it dreadfully because he and i used to be such friends what does he do he won't speak to me if he can help it replied alice fairly crying by this time and when he is obliged to say anything he does so in such a queer hard voice that everybody round can see how he detests me i often dare not to speak to him when other people are there for fear he should snub me before them and make me die of shame why don't you ask him if he is offended with you i did and he said why would you suppose i am offended with you miss martin if my conduct has given rise to this suspicion i must have been sadly wanting in courtesy and i humbly apologize then i felt ready to sink into the earth how horrid of him he and i used to be so fond of each other when we were children but lately he has put up palings all around himself as if he were a tree in a park and won't let me come near him it really is queer agreed joanna i begin to think the real reason is that he considers us common sobbed alice of course i know we don't belong to a good old family like the fords 
but we are just the same as we always were and it is unkind and snobbish of edgar to throw over his old friends because he is ashamed of them and all that time edgar ford was congratulating himself on behaving as a man of honor towards paul and alice and he was positively wearing himself out with his superhuman efforts to hide from the latter the fact that he cared for her truly the ways of a conscientious man are sometimes difficult to fathom End of chapter 3